Hassan, and I'm an associate professor at Shirley School of Business. Um, one of the interesting problems that you have with uh, trying to develop new business models, and particularly innovative ones, is that uh, it's hard to visualize what they're all about. And there's kind of two parts of that. One is that uh, you have to get usually a group of people all on the same page uh, to understand what each other's talking about and to understand the model that they're designing together. The second thing is you've got to be able to describe all the different components that go into actually creating a, a functioning organization. And uh, just not the part that generates profit, but all the other things that are part of making a sustainable organization. And that includes things like the uh, environmental sustainability and the social sustainability of the, uh, of the actual organization and its business model. So I think this is one of the things that makes this work that you're going to be uh, experiencing tonight uh, so exciting, uh, is it does provide a method and a toolkit for actually looking at sustainable business models. And that brings us to our guest tonight, Anthony Upward. And uh, Anthony and I have known each other for a while now. Uh, before we knew each other, he was a uh, successful uh, consultant for about 22 years. And he was uh, he described himself as a business architect right, during those consulting uh, years. Um, he also uh, recently completed three years graduate uh, education here at York University in the, in the uh, Faculty of Environmental Studies and Shirley School of Business. And uh, his whole uh, graduate work was based on the uh, looking at this whole idea of developing a sustainable business model uh, and a methodology for how you would do this or how groups, uh, people and organizations would develop these models and innovate these models. Um, his next step after, uh, after developing this project was of course now to disseminate this uh, throughout uh, the economy and have organizations, whether they're firms or not-for-profit organizations or governments, to use this model and to come up with these innovative business models. And so his uh, next step here is uh, looking for crowdfunding uh, and that sort of thing, and uh, that will be take this uh, strongly sustainable business model technique uh, to the next level. So, without any further ado, let me introduce Anthony Upward. So thank you, David, for that very kind introduction. It's, it's very good to be here this evening. So as David said, my name is Anthony Upward, and I'm a sustainability business architect with Edward James Consulting, and I'm also the co-founder of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, the Ontario College of Art and Design University's Strategic Innovation Lab. And tonight, I'd like to introduce you to a new visual design tool for designing all kinds of businesses that are fitter for the increasingly uncertain future that we face the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Canvas. So let's get started. Today, most business people go to work every day with the goal of maximizing profit. And this profit is used to do all kinds of good things for many people. Education, pensions, healthcare, roads, fire services, public transit, police, and so on. Business people are starting to see, however, that despite all the benefits that the wealth is creating, the unintended social and environmental impacts of their operations are growing larger and larger. Businesses are creating some bad outcomes for a lot of people and our environment. Increasingly, business people understand that these bad outcomes are preventing humanity and other life from flourishing. Their children and grandchildren are hurting and they can see that it's getting worse. Not only that, but every day they can also see that increasing risks to their company's supply of raw materials, their social license to operate, as well as near-term profit and long-term viability. And worse, they can see that they're missing out on opportunities to innovate in response to all these challenges. The result, the thing they said they cared about most profit, are in trouble. Contrast this with businesses that focus on doing good, environmentally, socially and economically, for all their stakeholders. Why, that, why might this make a better business, one that's more likely to consistently do well? First, better businesses do a better job at managing risk. Businesses that focus solely on making money are very surprised when they're impacted by events which arise first outside the markets in which they operate and generate profit. Things like climate change, water shortages, income inequality, and other mega forces all occurring outside the markets are starting to impact firms worldwide. Ultimately, only focusing on doing well will have unintended consequences that will impact profits. Second, they do a better job of understanding and exploiting the opportunities that are arising because of these same mega forces. Because they do a better job of managing risk and exploiting new opportunities, these new businesses are more resilient. They're more likely to survive and flourish for the long term. 
So better businesses are simply better and fitter for an increasingly uncertain future. They create less unintended social and environmental consequences and can actually proactively create outcomes that enable flourishing for us, our children, our grandchildren and the world around us. So if you've decided to create a better business, you need to design a strategy and a business model to meet that goal. How do you do that? How can you be efficient at designing your better business? The previous best practice for how you design a business can be summarized as follows. You have an idea which you write up in your business plan. You convince people to give you money. You work hard and you cross your fingers. And this approach is still very widely used despite the fact that it doesn't reliably produce profitable businesses. Clearly, compared to other fields of design, like, say, designing a car, where we're really pretty good at designing reliable cars now, our approach to designing businesses really has some problems. Indeed, some people have said the problems are so bad that they liken this approach for designing businesses to deliberately burning piles of cash from investors. Of course, some business failures are because these businesses are simply not fit for purpose. But I think we all acknowledge that there are significant financial, social, personal, and environmental costs when firms go out of business. It's clearly not a good thing when a business fails, whether you're an employee, a customer, an investor, or a member of a community where a business is located and does business. Can't we more reliably design successful businesses? With this question in mind, nearly 10 years ago, Alex Osterwalder and Prof. Yves Pigneur set out to improve things, using the process of design to more efficiently, effectively, and reliably create businesses that would be profitable. And the result is the Profit First Business Model Canvas, a paper-based visual design tool to more reliably design profitable businesses. This tool has a solid theoretical underpinning, which was described in Alexander Osterwalder's 2004 PhD, and it's also described in a very accessible way in the now very popular book, Business Model Generation. As of this summer, it sold over 700,000 copies. It's now in 26 languages, and it's been in the top 10 Amazon business books since it was launched in 2009. And more recently still, it's been complemented by an iPad and a web app that enhances the usability of the canvas. Now, before we ask for the money for our business, we know that if we answer the nine questions the business model canvas asks us, the likelihood is that our pile of cash will actually create a profitable business and not go up in smoke. Clearly a big step forward over the previous best practice for designing business. But the business model canvas only focuses on the questions that drive monetary profitability. It ignores almost all the other things that are important if you want to design a better business. The existing tools and best practices for creating businesses don't ask the questions that, you need, that need to be answered if you want to create a better business with fewer unintended, con unintended consequences, or if you want your business to create the conditions for human and other life to flourish. This means it's hard to create better businesses with these tools. So how can we efficiently and reliably and effectively design better businesses? This was the question I set out to answer in my recently completed three-year graduate research project conducted here at York. I went all the way back to Alex Osterwalder's PhD, where he defined an ontology for profitable business models. Then I used all the natural and social science about how to design businesses that do good and do well to extend Osterwalder's work to create an ontology for strongly sustainable businesses. But also, like Osterwalder, I knew I needed to simplify and make a tool that was easy to use, but without losing any of the rich possibilities for designing better businesses that I'd learnt about. So again, following Osterwalder's lead, I used my ontology to power a new, easy-to-use visual design tool to help businesses to help design better businesses, the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Canvas. The Strongly Sustainable Canvas asks 14 questions that, if answered well, significantly increase the likelihood of designing a better business. This is the tool we'll be using shortly, so I want to spend a few minutes walking through the improved canvas for designing better business. To do this, I want to go back to Osterwalder's canvas, which I now refer to as the Profit First canvas, since that's what it's designed to do. The nine questions in the Profit First canvas are the ones that you must answer to increase the likelihood of having a profitable business. So here's a quick example. This actually comes from Alex's PhD, um, and it's the Montreux Jazz Festival. So on the right-hand side, uh, we have a number of customer segments. So in this case, visitors to the festival, the sponsors, the recording artists, uh, franchisees of various sorts. We have a number of channels to get value propositions to them, the events themselves, uh, we have the website for selling tickets and ticket counters for selling tickets as well and a number of other uh, channels. And then we have the value propositions that are created, the concerts themselves, the recordings that are made of those concerts and a number of others. And all of those drive us, uh, the revenue streams which are down at the bottom on the right and then on the left we have the things that drive costs, the activities, the resources and the partnerships. 
and those drive the costs at the bottom. So this gives you a sense of how you go about using the canvas. You can imagine a team at the Montreux Jazz Festival putting these sticky notes onto the canvas and discussing them and having a common language and a common way of, of approaching this design task that's in front of them. So the nine questions, as I said, give us a common language to discuss, describe, and improve our profit first business model designs, and that's clearly a good thing. But as we've discussed, these questions aren't so useful if the goal is to create a better business. From my research, I knew that financial viability is a critical component of better business. So it's not that the nine questions are wrong or inappropriate. To have a better business, you must still be profitable, but you, so you still need to answer these same nine questions. Now, what I realized was that the nine questions were necessary, they just weren't sufficient if you want to design a better business. So what was missing to design a better business design tool? The first thing I realized was that there are some important differences in how things are defined. People focusing on creating profitable businesses have suggested that a business model is a model that describes the rationale for how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. And when they use the word value, they mean in monetary terms, and that's it. But this definition becomes quite problematic if you're trying to create a better business, which recognizes, if only to a very small degree, the need to create different types of value for lots of different types of stakeholders. For example, recent work suggests that the definition of value needs to be far more universal. In the strongly sustainable business model, we take value to mean the perception by a human or a non-human actor of a need being met, measured in aesthetic, psychological, physiological, utilitarian, or monetary terms. It's a much broader definition of value. And of course, this means we need a broader understanding of how value is created and destroyed. So in the strongly sustainable world, value is created when needs are met by satisfiers that align with the recipient's worldview, and they're destroyed when they don't. And in turn, this leads to a new definition of business, and a new definition of business models. A business model now becomes the logic for an organization's existence who it does it for, to, and with, what it does now and in the future, how and where and with what does it do it, and how it defines and measures success. And that can all be simplified down to a business model now is a description of how an organization defines and achieves success over time. So that was the first thing. The second thing that I realized from the literature of both the profit first and strongly sustainable business is that in the profit first world, businesses don't recognize all of their contexts. The real context for business is not just the economy, because of course the economy, the financial system, is something created by society, and society has far broader concerns than simply money. Societies care about people and the well-being of the people within them, and they try to seek to help everyone achieve their potential. But it doesn't stop there. The context of business has to include more than just society, because society is entirely dependent upon the environment. Without clean air, water, and healthy soil, we would all go bankrupt, and we would all go out of business. So a sustainable business model is one whose definition of success recognizes and must relate to all these contexts, economy, society, and the environment. The third thing that I recognized was that from looking at just the profit first literature, businesses are really not simple. They're really pretty complicated. There's a lot to juggle. And then when I looked at the strongly sustainable literature, I saw that when you put a business into its real context that we just described, a really inconvenient truth emerges. There are even more things to think about if you want to do good and do well. So the thing that I realized was missing from the Profit First canvas was a way of dealing with this additional complexity. Now, one of the common ways of dealing with complexity is to break things into more manageable parts or perspectives. And from my earlier professional career, I knew that one of the most well-known perspectives on business often used to implement new strategies is the balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard has four perspectives, but it too just focuses on profit. And you can see the perspectives here, financial, customer, internal processes, and learning and growth. So to use the balanced scorecard in the context of a strongly sustainable business, I needed to adapt these perspectives to that new context, to all the three contexts. So how did I do that? First is the stakeholder perspective. This is who a firm does it. Who does a firm do it to, for, and with? You'll note finance is no longer first. And second, we have to generalize the names of the perspectives to properly recognize all three contexts. In this case, we've changed customer to stakeholder. Now we can talk about all the stakeholders of a firm, not just the ones who pay. Second is the product learning and development perspective. Note how, long, how we're no longer concerned with just today's value propositions, but also the value proposition related to how a firm continues to develop over time. 
The third is the process perspective. How, where, and with what does a firm do it? Note that since we've recognized society and the environment, we now need to explicitly think about how we do things, which stakeholders are involved, and where things are done. Fourth and last is the measurement perspective, how a firm defines and measures its success. This generalizes away from just the financial view to include a broader definition of value that we discussed a moment ago. The fourth thing I got from the literature was that we need to include all the businesses involved in a business model, not just the organization at the center of a business model. We need to look at the business models from across the whole value chain. To do this, we start with the real context of business that we discussed a moment ago, the environment containing an enabling society, which in turn defines and operates the economy. And we see how individual businesses relate to all these contexts. Then we add the four perspectives that make understanding how a business relates to the context more manageable. And lastly, we can add all the organizations involved in a business model and how each perspective and all three contexts relates. In the example shown here, we've got a business model and a value system with three firms. Now this three-dimensional view is great, but it's rather hard to work with as a visual design tool. So in the Strongly Sustainable Canvas, we flatten it to two dimensions. Remember, none of these contexts are considered by the profit-first business model canvas and the questions that it asks. The fifth and final realization I got from comparing the literature on strong sustainability and profit-first business models was that considerable amounts of important detail are missing from the questions the profit-first canvas asks. But as I've mentioned, I also realized that, of course, being profitable is still a critical element of being a better business. So I concluded that since the Profit First Canvas has proven itself so successful, better business model design tool still needs to completely include all nine original questions. As I worked my way through the implications of adding the context and perspectives to the nine original questions, I saw that what was missing was the ideas that you need to consider in order to avoid the so-called unintended consequences and the sometimes called externalities of Profit First Business. It's by adding the drivers of these impacts that enables a better business model designer to systematically get a more complete view of the risks and the opportunities in their business model. Overall, the adjustments to the nine questions tend to generalize them. As we've already seen, we're no longer interested in just customers, but all stakeholders. We're no longer interested in only measuring businesses financially, but socially and environmentally as well. However, there were also five brand new ideas that were just plain missing from the Profit First canvas. Without these ideas, the literature suggested it would not be possible to describe many important aspects of better business. So the net result is we move from nine questions of the Profit First canvas to 14 questions that we need to answer in order to have the possibility for a better business, one that does good and does well. So let's go through each of the four perspectives and look at that detail. As we've already discussed, we've got the context, we've got the firm boundary, and we've got these first two things that are outside of the firm boundary. So these are actors and the needs of those actors. So think about actors as the pool of all the potential stakeholders for all the businesses in the business model. So this gives you a chance to think fundamentally about who are you going to choose to be your stakeholders. Because let's make no mistake, it's a choice who you make as your stakeholders. You can decide that an NGO is going to be a stakeholder, you can choose that an NGO is not going to be a stakeholder. You can choose which customers or which customer segments you go after from a much larger pool. You can choose whether which uh, companies you're going to buy from, which are you're going to be your suppliers. So this allows you to think about all of your potential stakeholders. And those potential stakeholders all have fundamental human needs. So you're probably all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. There are some more modern ones like Max Neef's uh, Nine Universal Human Needs, which I personally prefer. But it's the same basic idea. Those, state, those actors are all going to have needs. Now, when we come to think about value propositions in a minute, what's the real purpose of a value proposition? Well, it's actually to fulfill a fundamental need in some respects. And in fact, if you don't fulfill a fundamental need, the likelihood is you don't have a very uh, profitable business model, let alone a sustainable one. So this actually gives us a chance to sit down and think, before we've even decided who are our stakeholders, who are the pool of stakeholders, and what is it that they really want in relation to whatever it is we're, we're doing in our business? The stakeholders then become the actors that you choose to legitimate. Go ahead, Thomas. So it's the fact that I'm seeing some of these things within the, the economic environment and some things outside, is that meaningful or is that just... I, I, no, absolutely it's meaningful. So for example, an NGO would be probably in the pink zone because an NGO would have uh, mostly be interested in maybe um, doing something for other human beings. You know, they're there to represent a disadvantaged or minority group. Or they actually could be representing a non-human, right? That could be the Sierra Club, for example, representing the natural environment or you know, a particular species of animal. So 
um, yes, the, the, the coloration there, the idea that actors could in fact be uh, not concerned about money at all, or in fact they could even be non-human. You know, uh, as one example that I read about, uh, you know, you have a power plant, it's dumping hot water into a stream, um, it's killing off all the wildlife in the stream because the temperature of the water goes up. So does that make the wildlife in that stream a stakeholder? I don't know, that's the choice of the power company, but at least this model gets you to think about who could be the non-human actors that might be concerned about what this power plant is doing. Does that answer the question? Excellent. So stakeholders are the people you've chosen in your business model to legitimate, the actors that you've chosen to legitimate, and, and whose needs you're going to try and fulfill. Then we've got the relationships we desire to have with all of those stakeholders. And these relationships and the equity in those relationships are, are what we need to be concerned about growing and making sure we've got value propositions to help us grow those. The channels are as before, the channels for delivering our value propositions, but now we've got to be concerned about delivering the value propositions to all of our stakeholders. So for example, a manager might actually be the channel to deliver an employee value proposition to an employee. Or another example, um, the purchasing department in an organization might be the channel to deliver the value proposition for your suppliers. So one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves is why would, a, why would uh, I buy from this supplier? It's not just, what, or sorry, why would this supplier sell to me? It's not just a question of why will this customer buy from me? So we've now got to think about not only sales as being a channel, but we've also got to think about purchasing as being a channel as well, potentially. Moving on to the second perspective, product learning and development, what a firm does now and in the future. Again, we've got the perspective shown here, we've got the firm boundary. Obviously, most of this is going to be inside the firm, the business models uh, of the firms involved. Um, and we've talked about the fact that value propositions need to combine environmental, social, and economic factors for all the stakeholders, both now and in the future. Let's just talk about the future for a second. Clearly, we can't predict what we're going to do in the future. However, we do know that some of our stakeholders will want the firm to exist for potentially a long time. So employees, many of them will want to work for us for a long time. Customers will presumably want to buy from us for a long time, uh, and in the manufacturing sense, spare parts are always going to be an issue. So there's going to be quite a lot of our stakeholders who want us to continue to exist. So while we may not be able to describe the value propositions that we'll deliver in the future, what we can offer our stakeholders today is a value proposition about how we will ensure that we will continue to continuously improve and, and uh, come up with new innovations so that we can survive and can thrive in the future. So that's when we talk about in the future, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how will you continuously improve, how will you develop the business. The other thing that we need to think about here, going back to the actors, so presumably you're not going to make every single possible actor your stakeholder, right? So that means that some of the actors are outside, but they have needs that you're going to be touching in some way. So for example, let's say you choose an, not to make an NGO a stakeholder and that NGO cares about a particular plant or animal that your operation is impacting, that NGO will think that you're creating negative value for them. Now, if you choose not to make them a stakeholder, they might actually start a boycott against you. Right? And that's in fact happened, that's how the Forest Stewardship Council started, it was the Rainforest Action Network um, starting a boycott against Home Depot. Home Depot didn't recognise the Rainforest Action Network as one of its stakeholders, but believe you me, they do today. So you need to think about the negative value you might create. And this is actually another area where competitors might come in. So maybe you don't consider your competitors your stakeholders, except perhaps through an industry association. But maybe your competitors will see something you're going to do as a negative to them. And how are they going to react about that? And what do you want to do about that? So you need, need to think about that side of things. Process perspective. Again, we've got the perspectives clearly shown. Uh, sorry, the context clearly shown. And we've got the firm boundary. First detail in this area is decisions. So one of the things that is not included in the Profit First Canvas is who gets to decide what you do, what your definition of success is, how you do it. So this is all about power. So we need to think about which of your stakeholders are you going to give what power to. So obviously, typically the power resides in senior management, um, but in many companies already today you'll find that some employees have control over a health and safety budget. They're given that budget and they're told they're responsible for how the health and safety in the organization is going to be managed. And that's really pretty independent decision-making power and governance away from other things. In some organizations, decision-making is becoming much more devolved. So, of course, in a cooperative, it becomes a completely different governance set or governance arrangements. Then we've got partnerships. So partnerships are the formal relationships that you have with some of your stakeholders. So obviously, you've got purchasing contracts. 
be a typical one, purchasing products and services. You also have formal contracts with employees. You also may have formal contracts with other stakeholders over certain developmental matters for research and development, for example. So this gives you a chance to think about partnerships with all your stakeholders, not just with your uh, suppliers. Then we have resources and activities. So we, as I've mentioned, we have these having environmental, social and economic aspects. Last but not least, back to us when your question, outside the firm boundary, we have the biophysical stocks. So this is the planet. This is everything on the planet. This is plants, trees, rocks, minerals, water, the air we breathe. It's everything that's out there. It's the stock of everything that's in the world. Now it's outside the firm because it's shared by everybody. Everything, all your resources have to come from a biophysical stock in some way, shape or form. And everything you do, every transformation you make to those resources has to ultimately go back to a biophysical stock. So again, in this model there's no such thing as waste. There may be things that we choose to call waste because we can't value them economically, but there is in fact no such thing as waste on a finite planet. The last one is the ecosystem services. So in the planet, we have a number of processes going on that use the biophysical stocks. So for example, uh, we have uh, things like a marsh, which consists of plants and animals that regulates stormwater flow. It uh, cleans pollution out of it, um, even naturally occurring pollution, and uh, it regulates the flow of that water back into the lake. That's an ecosystem service, that water regulation. But we also have other ecosystem services like photosynthesis. So that's the ecosystem service that takes sunlight and various biophysical stocks in the soil and turns it into plants that we can eat and that grow, that provide wood and fibre and various other things that we use in our businesses. Other ecosystem services are animal reproduction. So that's where, from a business perspective, we might get things like leather, meat, eggs, milk. That all comes from the ecosystem service of reproduction. So ecosystem services are actually fundamentally underpinning every single activity that a business does. And again, they're outside the boundary of every business. They're shared by everybody. So when you're designing a strongly sustainable business, you have to think about, well, based on where my factory is, based on where my operation is, how much of the local ecosystem services can I actually use without damaging them? Last is measurement. Again, we've got the perspective, or the context. Um, we've got the firm boundary. Obviously, measurement is something firms do for themselves, generally speaking, so most of this is within the firm boundary. The first thing we do here is we have to define what we mean by success. Now, clearly, for a profit-first company, it's going to be whatever profit level is required in order to provide the investors with the return on investment. But when we broaden this to include the social and environmental dimensions, there can be many other dimensions of success. In fact, most entrepreneurs that I've met so far would say that they're not in it for the money necessarily. They're actually in it to build something for their families, for their colleagues, to make a better world. Uh, and so many business people already think about success in much broader terms than just financial. So here we're actually allowing them to think about it uh, explicitly. Then we've got processes. So, that, so now we talk, start to talk about how we measure that definition of success you've come up with. So one of the ways you might want to measure it is ha measuring the output of your processes. How many of your product or service you deliver in a particular time frame, whether the quality is acceptable, how much CO2 it might produce, um, any process measure that you care to, to care to think about uh, would go here. Now, um, the next thing we want to talk about is the balance sheet side of things. So, businesses need assets, uh, not only financial but also non-financial. This gives you a chance to think about how you're going to measure those assets environmentally, socially and economically. Then we have all the things that relate to the profit and loss statement. So we've got how you price things, that's the valuation method. Clearly some of those process measures I mentioned a moment ago may be priced. Clearly your value propositions will need to be priced at least economically so that you can actually get revenue uh, economically. And then we've got the revenues and costs and obviously you can subtract the costs from the revenues to get your what I now call tri-profit rather than just profit. And as you can see that this could be quite different from triple bottom line where triple bottom line suggests you need to convert everything into monetary terms. Here we're now talking that maybe it's acceptable to leave some elements of profit in a non-monetary unit. So, when you put all that together, you get the canvas as it looks like here. And here's an example. You obviously can't read this. This is actually done on the wallboards that you see around the room here. Uh, this is an example of Timberland. Uh, this was based on publicly available information that Timberland published on their websites and elsewhere. Uh, in the middle of 2011. Um, and just to give you a few examples, um, in the stakeholder area, um, they recognize 14 NGOs as stakeholders. They actually explicitly say we have these NGOs as stakeholders and they have value propositions for those NGOs. 
Uh, one of those NGOs is an NGO related to um, worker rights in the developing world. And they actually also have as a stakeholder uh, not only their employees, but the employees of their suppliers. So they actually say that the people who make the boots in the factories in Southeast Asia are in fact their stakeholders. Now clearly this is rather different from many of the apparel companies that we've seen recently uh, in the event that's happened, the appalling event that happened in Bangladesh, where we had a number of Canadian companies who almost threw up their hands and said, well, it's nothing to do with us. So Timberland didn't do that. And Timberland then go even further and they actually say, well, what's the channel to get to those, employ uh, those supplier employees? And they actually have a whole program which their employees go out to the suppliers and deliver directly to the supplier employees to help those supplier employees make sure that they've got a healthy and safe workplace uh, in which to produce the boots of Timberland. So I, I won't go through any more details, but you can start to see how real businesses are thinking much more broadly about uh, some of these topics than uh, perhaps uh, the Profit First Canvas might suggest. So um, I'm going to leave you with what's coming up on the screen right now. This is kind of the summary, so this is kind of a crib sheet for the rest of the evening. So these are the 14 questions. Some of these, uh, I've grouped some of the uh, uh, examples that we just went through into to get to the 14. So what are the next steps to bring the better, strongly sustainable business model campus to the world to help create more, better businesses? There are three things that I'd like to share. First, my thesis, which contains the canvas, is licensed under a Creative Commons license, but this has a commercial restriction. So if you want to start using the canvas today, you need to join our first Explorers program. It's just a simple mutual NDA and sharing agreement to sign, because what we want to encourage as many people as possible to start using the canvas. There's no cost involved. Next, you can join us. We're launching a crowdfunded collaborative project to create the toolkit to design better businesses. The project will then publish a book that explains the toolkit, including the new canvas, the known good answers to the 14 questions the canvas asks, and the steps to use the canvas effectively. The core team of the book now consists of an international group of 13 co-authors, and of course we're using the Strongly Sustainable Canvas to design the business model for the project and the business we plan to launch to further develop the toolkit to include an app, versions for specific industries, and for classroom use, and so forth. The details of the crowdfunding are now being planned, but we already can say that we'll be seeking both individuals and organizations to back the project. As one of several incentives, our backers will also get immediate commercial rights to use the new canvas and have input into the content of the book. We're hoping to publish in 2015, and when we do, the final version of the canvas will be released under a Creative Commons license without a commercial restriction, so everybody will be able to use it. Finally, if you'd like to connect, share, and learn from the other people involved in our project, creating better tools to design better businesses, we have both a LinkedIn group and a Facebook page to help with this. So we hope to see you there soon. I hope you found this introduction to the Better Strongly Sustainable Business Model Canvas useful, and I hope you want to stay in touch with our work as we bring these better tools to the world, perhaps even get involved yourself. All the links to connect with our project are shown on this slide, and below the video there's a link to download the slides, which have all the speaker's notes and references on them. Thank you.